say I'm not. All right, we are, whoa. <laughs> Let me just get that for you. We are finishing chapter 15 today. We have spent a long time in chapter 15, but that's okay. It is, uh, it has a lot of information in it, so, um, yeah, no apologies. We are going to be uh, wrapping it up today, though, talking about mollusks and echinoderms. And so this is the last two invertebrate phyla um, in this chapter, and then next chapter we can talk about bugs, which are awesome. Um, so mollusks and echinoderms, that's where we are today. I'll pause here for a moment while you're ready. Okay, so mollusca first. Mollusca is a very, very diverse phyla. There are lots of things in there that at first, like if you were to just put them next to each other, you would say really those belong in the same phyla. Um, the distinguishing characteristics of mollusca, though, are shared by all of these rather different looking critters. Uh, one of them is a mantle. That is the most important feature of a mollusk. That is the, uh, the most easily recognizable defining feature of this phylum. Uh, a mantle, excuse me, a mantle is a smooth sheath of tissue that surrounds the vital organs and usually secretes a shell. Now, outside of biology, the word mantle means like cloak, like a poncho, something that you would throw over the top of you to keep the weather off, okay? Um, so that word, that garment, uh, was used as the name for this sheath of tissue. It's not, it doesn't hug the animal tightly. It's kind of just thrown over the top. It's, it looks like it's sitting there fairly loosely um, over the vital organs. And so um, it's, it's similar to quote unquote skin in, in other animals, but it, it's draped across the top of the animal as opposed to like, I don't know, hugging some kind of body shape. Uh, and you'll see that as we look at all of the different mollusks that are there. Um, sometimes mollusks have shells. I should say, usually mollusks have shells. And the shell will be secreted by the mantle. So the mantle sits somewhat loosely over the organs and then um, makes a shell on top of it. Okay. And in mollusks, we call a shell a valve. So if a mollusk has one shell, they're a univalve. If mollusks have two shells, they're a bivalve. Um, so valve is the word for a shell, which is kind of strange. You don't necessarily think of a valve, something that you turn on and off water as meaning a shell, but somehow the idea is related. Um, their organs, when you, we start to dissect mollusks next week, their organs are a seemingly disorderly pile. They, when you cut into the organs of your squid next week, you will, you will see that the organs, it looks like God just said, okay, I need one of those, I need one of those, and I need one of those. There you go. And it's not like, uh, I don't know, it's not organized. Not all of you will see all of your organs in the exact same place when you cut open your squid. Um, so they have this thing called the visceral mass, where the organs are just... In them. Um, and they're, they're in a somewhat disorderly pot. Um, snails are worse. Uh, last year we dissected snails when we got to mollusks, and uh, it really frustrated the students to try to find the stomach and find the penal gland and find all these things. They were just like, oh. so I think a squid is a little easier because it's going to be a lot bigger. So that should be, you should be not as frustrated as the snail people were last year. Um, but the organs are somewhat just thrown in there. They all have this muscular organ called a foot. Um, and uh, for some animals, they crawl on it. So snails crawl on their foot, so that makes sense. But for squid, their foot has been cut into eight pieces. And their foot is this thing that goes around their mouth. And you're like, it's the foot? Well, yeah. Um, it's this muscular mass that they use for locomotion for a clam. The foot is inside and can come out and like lick the sand around the clam. Um, so it's in a different place in all the different mollusks, but they all have this muscular organ used for lo locomotion and feeding. And they all have a tongue with a filing tooth. 
the, the, the tongue is like a file. And when a snail eats, it doesn't take a bite. It doesn't have a beak. It opens its mouth, and out comes a filing tongue. And it licks pieces of food off of what it wants to eat. Uh, so I'm, I'm glad that we don't eat that way. It look kind of strange. Do you like have sharp, sticky, pointy outies on your tongue, and you take a ah, lick of your food? It's just, I don't know, something out of a horror movie. But that's what that's what snails do. Um, so that's called a radula. That's their filing tongue. And they all like the annelids. Uh, they all have a closed circulatory system. So they'll have a heart, and they'll have arteries and veins, and all that kind of good stuff. Okay. Um, pictures. This is a clam. But he serves as a good example of a basic mollusk. So there's a mantle, this, this outer sheath layer of tissue that surrounds the whole thing is the mantle. Um, and there's a cavity inside the mantle in which the gut is just kind of thrown in there. Um, and there, they will have a mouth and a stomach, and they'll have an intestine and an, uh, an, an anus. They've got a, a one-directional. Um, uh, into the digestive tract. They don't have a mouth and anus. They've got a mouth and an anus. Uh, and they have a heart and a circulatory system. Um, they've got gills and they've got this muscular foot. And the um, and then this is a clam. He's got actually two shells, two valves. Some mollusks only have one. Okay. We're going to look into three classes of mollusk. Well, there are more than three classes of mollusk. We're going to look at three classes of mollusk. There are, I think, seven or five or something like that. But we're going to only look at a couple of them. Uh, the first one is bivalvia. Bivalvia has two shells. Valve in a mollusk means a shell. And bivalve, two shells. These are clams, mussels, oysters, scallops, yummy things that you like to steam and put in soup. Um, and uh, so these are, are critters that you find Obviously, in the marine environments, there are some freshwater clams, but not nearly as many as there are in the ocean. Um, their valves, if you dissect a shell, which is hard because they're hard, but you can, um, the shell has three layers, okay? Going from the outside in, oh, there's a phone call. Going from the outside in, ring, ring. So the outside layer, um, if you've ever looked at a clam shell, is not smooth. It's it's bumpy. It's got like crags and crevices and stuff on it, and it's usually a darker color than the inside of the shell. That's called the horny layer because it looks like a horn. It's made out of that same hard protein that uh, an, an animal's horns would be made out of, right? That's the horny layer, um, and then the prismatic layer underneath that is white and is made out of calcium, okay? Um, and so this is the, the thickest part of the shell. Most of the mass of the shell is the prismatic layer. And then the pearly layer is the smooth, highly polished surface of the shell that would lie against the mantle. And that is where pearls are made. Um, if, you, if, a, if a clam gets a little piece of, of sand um, in between the mantle and the shell, that's a point of irritation, and it doesn't want to irritate the, uh, the mantle with this piece of sand, so it lays down uh, mother of pearl or that the pearly layer material on top of the sand to make it smooth so it doesn't bother the clam as much, and that's where we get um, pearls from. Yep. Uh, and so the, it, has, it has valves. It filters water through siphons, and then the gills catch plankton and sweep it to its mouth with, it, with its foot. So uh, in some of the annelids, the gills were filter feeding devices. And that same strategy is used here in the, in the clams and the bivalves. They filter feed through their gills. So the gills, uh, you know, water is moving through them so they can respire. And little bits of stuff get caught in the gills. And then the clam will use its foot, its muscular foot, to clean the gills off and move all that stuff to the mouth. So then the mouth will eat whatever gets stuck to the gills. Um, and then that is what, that's what the clam eats. So it's filtering through its gills and then 
sweeping the gills clean and eating what it catches. Okay? And it does have a complete digestive system like all mollusks do. Here's a picture of a dissected clam. Um, and you can, you know, you could do this dissection at home if you wanted to, because you can go buy clams in the grocery store and then carefully open it up and look at what's in there. Um, there's generally two big uh, muscles, and in this leprous image, it's hard to see, but the adductor muscles here um, are what hold the clam shut. And then the muscular foot is right here. This is the organ that the clam can use to crawl through the sand, to dig a hole in the sand, uh, or to sweep its gills clean. Um, and then the mantle is this sheet of tissue against the shell. It has gills up top, um, and the, the mouth is right here. And then the mouth will go through, and this is the vis visceral mass under the gills. And then the, uh, the anus is going to be right over here. And it will, it will eat and process the food and poop it out. And then the, uh, the siphons, which are not labeled, but the siphons would be down over this end, will squirt water out and suck water in um, to allow this clam to filter feed and remove its wastes and things of that nature. So it's actually a cool little creature. Um, when we eat them, I don't think we take much into account about how cool they are, but there they are. And you eat the whole animal when you eat clam. Um, so, yeah, it's neat. It's very cool. This is just a diagram of it, so it's a little easier to see. Um, clams bury themselves in the sand. I don't know if you've ever seen them in their wild natural habitat, but they use their foot to dig a hole and pull themselves down under the sand. And then they stick their siphons out to just at the, the water surface, and they suck water in and out um, and filter feed and live below the water. So when you go clamming, you, you dig just a little bit under the surface of the sand and you'll, you pull clams up. Ten, uh, typically, you've got to be you've got to be below the low tide mark, so you've got to be in the water. Uh, and then if you look at the at the surface of the uh, sand, you'll see holes in the sand, right? And um, those holes are the, the siphon points. The clam is buried underneath, and he's siphoning water through those points. So that if you dig um, underneath there, you'll, you'll pull the clam. So, no. Um, these are some mollusks that, uh, that the, the mussels tend to live in the intertidal zone. So they're okay with being exposed for part of their day. And when they're exposed, they just shut their valves and don't let the water in or out. And they kind of hold their breath for the, high, for the low tide periods of time. Um, these guys are buried in the mud. Um, some are on rocks and things of that nature. This is a siphon of a clam sticking up uh, above the water line, it's sorry, the, the sand line. So this is sand and then a, a, a mollusk siphon sticking up out of the sand. Most of the time they're below the, the level of the sand, but this guy didn't quite get deep, get deep enough. Um, and this, it, oh, this is the pearly prismatic layer or the pearly layer of a shell and the uh, a, an oyster, or sorry, a um, pearl in it. And um, I'm just showing you that that's the way they're made. They come in all different sizes and shapes. Uh, this one is pretty large, um, measuring across at about uh, four or so centimeters. Um, so they can get pretty big. Some, some are quite large. This is this whole big black um, thing that you're seeing here is one clam. And it's kind of hard to tell in this image, but this is a clam sitting with its mouth, not mouth, but with the valves open, right? And in giant clams like this, the mantle actually grows around the shell. So this black tissue is the mantle, um, and it's grown out around the shell, and the, the giant clam is just sitting there on the ocean floor. And against that diver, you can tell how big they are. They can get very, very, very large. Um, and just as a little point of trivia, the 
oldest captive giant clam in the world. Not the largest one, but the oldest giant clam that is that is currently living in captivity is right here in the Waikiki So it's pretty cool if you go there, you can see. Uh, the next class we're going to look at is gastropoda. Gastro means stomach, and then poda means foot. So these are stomach feet. Um, these are these are creatures that slide along with a foot on their belly, um, and those are snails, slugs, and nudibranchs. Okay, um, they glide along on slime secreted under their foot, directly below the visceral mass. So I don't know. You guys are not old enough to have watched Gumby cartoons. Did anybody see Gumby? Never heard of it. Yeah, we have. Okay. Yeah, so it was an old claymation cartoon, and they would, you know, it was all stop, uh, stop motion clay, claymation, and rather than making Gumby try to walk, because that would, that's a lot of like points where you have to take a picture to make Gumby walk, they would just he he picked up his foot and then he would just like slide around on his foot to where he wants to go. And that was their lazy way of making him walk. But it became kind of like the Gumby walk, where you'd be like, oh, I'm going to just... Yeah. Well, he always reminded me of a snail. Because if he had if he had slime under his foot, he could just like slide over to where he's going to go, like roller skating with no wheels. Um, but that's what snails and slugs and nudibranchs do, is they secrete slime and then they um, swim through their slime. Um, they, they've got little muscle contractions along their foot that wave themselves through the slime, kind of like a snake moves on the sand. They move through their slime. Um, and so if they ever dry out to the point where they can't make slime, then they can't move. Um, and that's, that's the beginning, beginning of an end for a snail if it, if it gets dried out because um, it can't go anywhere. So... Um, Move along on slime secreted by their foot directly below the visceral mass. Asymmetrical. So um, you can't find a place to cut them in half and have two equal portions. For a clam, you could almost, they're almost bilaterally symmetrical, but um, their, their, organs are, their organs are still kind of in the visceral pile. And so you don't get exactly mirror halves of the organs in a clam either. But, you, but it's even worse in a snail. The, the visceral, visceral pile, visceral mass in a snail is really disorganized. Um, and so the, uh, there's no way of dividing that into two equal portions. So they are asymmetrical. Also, um, they have this feature called torsion, where uh, as a larva, they're bilaterally symmetrical. And then when they mature into adults, they twist, their, the back part of them twists up and piles up on top of them. And that, that is what creates their shell then that's, that spirals out to the side. Um, and that torsion feature makes them asymmetrical. You, can't, you can no longer find two equal halves of that animal. Um, they are a univalve. They have one shell. Um, and so the, uh, they're, they're univalves instead of bivalves. And some of them have a little door that they can close. Some snails, when you pick them up and you look at their foot, their foot closes up into their shell and you can still like touch the squishy part of the animal, right? Some snails, when you pick them up and they pull their foot in, there's a little piece of shell on part of their foot that when they pull it in, it closes the shell. And now they've got shell everywhere. And that little door is called an operculum. So not all snails have an operculum. Some snails do, some snails don't. Okay? Most of them are herbivorous. They have that filing tongue, and they'll crawl around on plants and file away the leaves and, and eat that way. That's how almost all snails uh, do eat. But some are predatory. Um, some are downright scary predatory. Um, and there are some large marine snails that are... Um, Serious hunters, and will and will eat other things, and they're not fast, so they're ambush predators, right? No snail is going to win a race, but they will hang out somewhere and wait for some stupid creature to come come in front of it, and then they have got very fast moving mouth parts, and they'll and they'll grab something and and swallow it, 
And when you see a snail do that, you're like, whoa, I didn't know you could move that quickly. Um, but yeah, they're awesome. And then um, some of them actually have poison darts, which is amazing. And they will lampoon an animal, and the animal will die from the venom. And then they'll crawl over on top of it and file it away and eat it. Um, kind of amazing, some of these things that God has put out there. Uh, and I just realized some of my words fell off the bottom of the screen. Nudibranchs eat cnidarians and incorporate their stinging cells into their gills. Incorporate their stinging cells into their gills. So they have gills with jellyfish stingers on them. And they didn't build the jellyfish stingers. Um, they stole their weapons from their enemy, right? So you're fighting in a war, your enemy falls, you run out of ammunition, you pick up your enemy's gun and keep fighting. Um, that's the idea here. These snails will eat corals and sea anemones and jellyfish, and not, not jellyfish, I shouldn't have said that, you know, <laughs> through the water, but corals and anemones, and then will take those stinging cells and put them in their own gills, and these, the nudibranchs have gills that float outside of them, and then now they're protected. If something comes to try to eat them, they get stung. Um, and they get stung by the stinging cells that used to be in an entirely different phylum of animal. It's pretty awesome. Um, so here's a dissected snail. I just wanted you to see the, the visceral mass that lies inside the shell. It's very, uh, very frustrating to try to get out. And it's totally not symmetrical. And you can see all the torsion that's in there as the animal is all twisted up inside that shell. Um, here's the mouth of a snail, and um, there's, you can just see the, the radula starting to peek out here. This is the filing tongue. Um, some snails get very large. This is a guy's hand, and these are snails. Um, there are some really, really big, uh, what are called tree snails. And we have tree snails on the island here too, but our tree snails, I mean, good-sized tree snails are going to be about the size of, like, a, a small mandarin orange. Um, but in the Amazon, there are tree snails that are, you know, the size of a man's hand. Big, big, big snails. Um, so snails come in all different sizes and shapes and colors, and some of these shells are gorgeous. And the, the beauty of these shells has led many peoples to use them as money. Native Americans used snail shells as, as currency. Um, did did Hawaiians use shells as currency? I don't know that piece of history. I don't think we used it. Well, we used teeves. Yeah. Jewelry. Yeah, and like tools. Yeah, Native Americans use as money, and you can see why. I mean, it it would be pretty easy to say this is worth one of something, and these are worth you know five of something, and and they come in all different colors and shapes, and so cool. there's currency already out there, um, which is pretty neat. Um, this is, uh, oh, this is a slug. Not all, not all snails have a shell, so this slug saying hi at you um, does not have a shell. His visceral mass is just exposed and he's wearing like a backpack on his back. Um, this is the all of its snail. This is the one that has the, the stinger. Um, and this little thing sticking out at the end of his body is the, uh, the opening for his harpoon. And so he will wait for a small fish or some other little animal to swim too close to him. And then he'll, he will shoot out this poisoned dart that injects venom and then comes back. He doesn't lose the dart. It doesn't go flying away. But he darts and, and then the animal will die. It's really bad venom. And then he will, he'll wait for the animal to die and he'll swim up on it and slowly eat it. So does it hurt if you like poke it? If he shoots you, you'll get wasted. I get wasted. Um, these snails don't exist here, um, but they do exist in uh, in Mexico and sometimes in San Diego. Sometimes they come that far north. They're called all of its snails. Um, they don't live in the intertidal. They live um, uh, in the littoral down down below. So you've got to be snorkeling or scuba diving or something like that to run across them. Um, but they're pretty cool. I mean, praise God for their their weaponry. Oh, this is a this is a, a sea hare. And this is a, a snail, and he is releasing ink. Um, and so same kind of uh, strategy as squid and octopus. They're also mollusks, and some 
Some snails have the ability to release ink as a, as a defense. Um, so this is a sea hare that's inking to try to get away from a predator. And then um, these are nudibranchs. So this, these are like antenna eye spots, and these are gills. And the gills have stinging cells on them. You would get stung if you touched this thing. And, but he didn't make the stinging cells. He stole them from, from Nigerians, which is just, it's awesome. It's awesome. Here's another one, covered in gills that are covered in stinging cells. Yeah. They're gorgeous. They're absolutely beautiful. Uh, how about that? This is a nudibranch that is sw that's swimming. Um, yeah. So because they sting, because they steal their stinging cells from things that they eat, uh, sea anemones and corals. Most of the time, corals aren't going to sting you enough to make you sick, and most sea anemones will not sting you enough to make you sick. But it depends on what they've eaten. If they if they've eaten a really uh, highly venomous uh, anemone. Then they have that anemone stinging cells, and you could get you could get hurt. So you never, yeah, you never know what they be. Um, but it's enough that you you want to give them their space, and most fish do. Last class we're going to look at today is cephalopoda. Cephalo means head, so these are headfoots. We've had bellyfoots, and now we have headfoots. Um, headfoots are animals that have divided the muscular foot into a bunch of appendages. And um, they wear those appendages around their mouth. So very strange, right? If we were to think about your foot being cut into eight pieces and then your mouth being in the middle of it, you get this weird mental image. Um, and that's what an octopus is. An octopus, a squid, a cuttlefish, and the nautilus. They all belong to this group called cephalopods. The foot divided into a number of sucker-laden arms. Um, and then they have uh, a very small shell, or they don't have a shell at all, except for the nautilus. The nautilus has a pretty awesome shell. Um, and, uh, but the others have a very small shell, if any at all. When we dissect the squid next week, you will pull the shell out of the squid, and they call it a pen because it looks like a pen. Um, and then squid also come with an ink sac, so you can write with the squid's pen and its own ink. It's pretty cool. You will. It's fun. Um, and so some of, the, some of these amazing things about, about cephalopods is that all of them can change colors to match their environment. Some of them are better than others. Some only can slightly change color. Some can become really anything that they want to become. Um, there's, a, there's a species of octopus called the, uh, the mimic octopus. And the mimic octopus is incredibly skilled at looking like other animals. Um, and so it can scare off potential predators by looking like something dangerous. Or it can look really harmless and entice things closer to it that wants to eat it and then it in turn eats them. Um, so it, it's amazing. It's amazing. <laughs> some of these things you wouldn't want stuck to your face. Um, some of them are, are venomous. Um, the, uh, the blue ring octopus uh, um, has a neural toxin that travels so fast that you will die before you know you've been stung. Oh. Um, so you will never feel the sting of the blue ring octopus. You will just be dead. Yes. Oh. Um, um, I don't and so, <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, they're down in Australia, so you don't have to worry about them here. So if you go to the Great Barrier Reef, you might. You yeah. definitely want to wear, even though the water is warm, you definitely want to wear um, a, a light wetsuit um, because there are several things like that. that yeah, okay, I, the most yeah. 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 I don't want to go think yeah. So, um, yeah, so, so uh, others, other octopus are uh, really talented at. Escaping from small holes and yeah, they're really cool. 
the largest eyes in the entire, in, in all of creation, uh, belong to the giant squid, and it's the largest eyes that have ever existed. Um, no dinosaur had bigger eyes than the eyes of the giant squid. So, um, some pretty cool things. This is a typical octopus. Um, again, the visceral mass is in this part of the octopus, the, the abdomen of the octopus. Um, the mantle is this, you know, layer around the visceral mass. There is no shell in an octopus. There is in a squid, um, just a little tiny one. Um, and then the foot has been divided into all these sucker arms, and the mouth is right in the middle. A nautilus is different. A nautilus looks like an octopus and a snail had a baby. Um, you've got the, the, the muscular foot hanging out here with all the tentacles and the beak in the middle, but then the body uh, is in this coiling shell. Now a snail shell has torsion, and the snail shell goes out to the side. The nautilus shell is bilaterally symmetrical. It's all coiled on right on top of this. So that's the difference between a snail shell and a nautilus shell. Um, this is uh, this is a this is an example of one of the many species of octopus that are down deep in the ocean floor uh, that we've only seen a couple times. But this guy this guy bioluminesces, so he can light up his arms, which attracts little fish because they're like ooh, bright and then and then he eats them, right? Um, That's like a pedophile right now. Wow. And that is captured for all time and eternity. Okay. <laughs> this is the. This is the. Okay. <laughs> We're sorry. This is the. Um, this is the the mimic octopus. Here he is looking like a stingray. Um, and and stingrays are predators, and so. Um, most animals would stay away from a stingray, so he does not want to be friendly right now with things around him. He looks like a stingray, and they stay away. Same thing if he wants to look like an eel. Um, he looks like an eel here, and again, things will tend to stay away from an eel. Um, here, he looks like a lionfish. And it's, you can't hardly see it very well. Here, he is being an octopus, and here, he's being a flounder. Now, a flounder is not a scary creature. And lots of things would eat a flounder. And so here, he's, he's hungry. He's trying to attract prey. He looks like a flounder. He lays there on the ocean floor. Somebody's like, oh, I'm going to eat you that. And they swim down, and then he's like, no, you're not. And he spins around with his arms and grabs it, and it's all over. And he has a meal. Um, so yeah, it's pretty cool. This, this looks like a sea snake or an eel, and it's just a tentacle of the octopus that he is sticking out of a crack in a rock, uh, trying to entice something. Um, to come by. So, pretty cool. The mimic octopus is pretty awesome. Oh, that's a big. Oh, is that in a museum? This is the giant. This is the giant squid. There is one species larger called the colossal squid. Um, but the giant squid, as you can see here, easily 15 to 20 feet long. Um, big, big, big squid. And this is the principal food source for sperm whale. Um, and they live very deep, a mile and a half and deeper in the ocean. They are only rarely seen by man because most of the time they never come to the surface. We only find them if they are sick and have wandered near the surface because they don't know where they are, or if they uh, get caught in, in nets of researchers. We don't tend to, fishing boats don't fish that deep because there's very little fish, but uh, deep sea researchers that'll drag a net two miles down just to see what's down there. Uh, will sometimes catch them. So that's what happened to this guy. He was caught in a uh, in a net being drugged two miles down just to see what they could find, and uh, they caught him. Um, this is one that was Whoa. sick and got to the surface. This is a colossal squid, um, and this one was... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> colossal squid get 40, get 40 feet or longer. Um, and uh, yeah, 40 feet or longer is a pretty significant creature. Um, and they, again, only only get up near the surface if they are ill and don't know where they are. Uh, they never on purpose are that close to the surface of the water. So this this fishing boat saw it and, uh, and harpooned it. And um, 
brought it in, and I'm sure they're not going to eat it because it's sick. But it gives science an opportunity to to learn more about these awesome creatures that are down down in the bottoms. Um, and then here is is the largest eye that God has ever made. Uh, it's this, it's about the size of this guy's head. Uh, and so, yeah, the biggest eye. <laughs> The biggest eyes God has ever made are on the colossal squid, um, and uh, and their their eyes are that big because they live way down deep where there's very little light, so they need to make the most use of the light that they that reaches them. Um, this is the nautilus, one of my favorite animals. Again, it looks like a snail and an octopus had a baby. Um, so the these are all the 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 tentacle arms. Um, and then its its visceral mass is in this uh, vertically coiling shell. And here's some nautilus swimming around. Oh, they didn't say like that. Do we have that here? Yeah, we have nautilus, but they 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 tend to be near the uh, near the drop off. You've got to go a ways. Drop off. Where are we to the drop off? There you go. Uh, we will do. Gosh, I'm not good at finishing lectures on time on Fridays. We still need to do a kind of I'll get those done soon. We'll be done. We'll be done for now.